parents are claiming a Virginia school district is indoctrinating their children into transgender ideology, and they're taking their case to court. The school district is also accused of hiding sensitive information on gender identity from parents. Tara Mergener has the details. Harrisonburg is one of several school systems faced with legal action in recent months. The lawsuit alleges the district is promoting gender fluidity while hiding it from parents. Middle school teacher Deb Figliola is one of those suing the district. We are putting kids in the middle of Un unknown territory. The policy in question requires teachers to ask students which name and pronoun is preferred and teachers must use it. A guidance counselor is to be notified if the student's choice is different from their biological sex, although school officials are forbidden to tell parents. Teachers were not to speak to parents at all. Uh, in any way, shape, or form, not even to refer to the new name that the student was using. The Alliance Defending Freedom has filed suit against Harrisonburg City Public Schools on behalf of six parents and teachers. As practicing Christians, the plaintiffs say this policy forces staff members to go against their faith, that it violates free speech and usurps parental rights. Experts agree that parents should be involved in important decisions like these in kids' lives. And so that's something that's so, so dangerous about this policy. District officials declined CBN's request for an interview, pointing us instead to this statement that reads in part, The focus is always to foster a team approach that includes and supports the unique needs of the student and family on a case-by-case -case basis. At least 18 states, along with D.C. and Puerto Rico, have recently issued school guidance in some form focused on inclusion and treatment of transgender students. Lene Erickson, who came out to her own parents years ago, calls the issue complicated. Folks are trying to figure out how to protect trans kids in a way um, that really respects all of the complicated dynamics in, um, you know, in talking to kids about their gender identity. Citing confidentiality and privacy, public schools often don't tell parents when students socially transition. They made the decision to keep a student's preferred pronouns of they and them instead of she under wraps. Like Harrisonburg schools, a growing number of districts and other states face complaints over secrecy. You took away my ability to parent my child, even before I had any knowledge. Others argue there are good reasons for not notifying parents. They point out examples, such as to avoid outing kids who could be in harm's way at home, or kids not ready to tell parents. Well, the number one priority is what is in the interests and welfare of the child. Deb, an educator of 25 years, however, maintains moms and dads are being kept in the dark at a time children need them most. Parents are the most important people in children's lives. Meanwhile, as the debate plays out, experts say the number of gender questioning youth is on the rise, partly because there is less social stigma. In Washington, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Well, I think the number one reason it's on the rise is the idea is being planted, and it's being planted at a development stage uh, where people are trying to figure out, children are trying to figure out who they are and, and what's their identity. Uh, all of us have gone through it, uh, and, you know, it's, it's interesting how in our teen years we think we're a whole lot smarter than our parents, and then... Uh, in our 30s, when we have children, uh, suddenly our parents become the wisest people on the planet. We should not have schools trying to separate parents from children and try to uh, foster some kind of secret atmosphere and that the parents aren't in the best interest of the child in this particular... It's absolutely insane. What is this is going to lead to? Well, it's going to lead to a destruction of our public school system, uh, something that has made America great, where we wanted to educate everyone. That was a key to democracy. Uh, what we're going to end up with is a public school system in shambles and parents being forced to educate their children on their own. In other news, widespread flooding in Kentucky has many people praying for a miracle. 
John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John. Thanks, Gordon. The flooding has been so fierce that homes have been washed away from their foundations, forcing thousands to run for higher ground. CBN's Brody Carter brings us this look at the devastation and the trouble that's still to come. We are currently experiencing one of the worst, most devastating flooding events in Kentucky's history. Oh, this is, oh my. At least 15 people are dead after torrential rains devastated parts of eastern Kentucky Thursday, and that death toll could rise. Fast rising waters turned creeks into gushing rapids and roadways into rivers. Some families were forced to their rooftops to be rescued. While thousands were sent to shelters, Governor Andy Bashir calling on the National Guard, issuing a state of emergency. What we're going to see coming out of this is massive property damage. Residents in the small town of Elkhorn City, population 1,000, say they're the highest floodwaters they've ever seen. Everything's gone, like, everything is gone. The National Weather Service now calling for even more rain, threatening many parts of Kentucky, along with areas in Virginia and West Virginia. Widespread flooding has also been hitting other parts of the country. Thursday, St. Louis, Missouri was underwater for the second time this week. I am in a river. I have no idea. Roadways covered in water. In Kentucky, widespread flooding is becoming a common disaster scene in the state's Appalachian region. Some communities are still recovering from massive floods in January and February with similar memories from 2020. With even more rain predicted for today, flooding will resume throughout the weekend. As the damage mounts, officials throughout the state requesting prayers for people hit by the devastating floodwaters. Asking everybody to pray. There's a lot of people out there who need help who are really scared right now. And we're doing the very best we can to reach each and every one of them. And I just ask people to remember in the, when you pray tonight, remember the people in your prayers that lost what they've had. And we're going to really need the help from our state, too, for this. Brody Carter, CBN News. And many indeed sending their prayers. Turning overseas, Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine is resulting in Moscow putting pressure on Israel. As CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl tells us, it could stop Russian Jews from immigrating to Israel. In a Moscow court on Thursday, Russia's Justice Ministry moved to ban operations of the Jewish agency. While foreign organizations have faced increasing pressure in Russia for years, threats recently ramped up. For the last eight years since Russia started its uh, war against Ukraine, when they occupied Crimea, they were demanding that they stop collecting information about citizens of Russia and transferring it to the West. But of course, for Jewish agency, it's a ridiculous demand because that's exactly what Jewish agency is doing. The Jewish agency is responsible for worldwide immigration to Israel. Former chairman Natan Sharansky, a Russian Jew and human rights advocate, helped clear the way for the exodus of two million Soviet Jews starting in 1986. We should not be desperate. At the same time, I'm warning all our friends in Russia and Ukraine those who are seriously thinking about Aliyah should better do it as quickly as possible because situation is worsening very quickly. Nearly 20,000 Russian Jews have immigrated to Israel since the invasion started, along with some 16,000 Ukrainian Jews. And there are another 20,000 in the pipeline. My estimation is that approximately three times more Jews will come from Russia than from Ukraine. In Russia, he says, citizens are losing freedoms at such a rate, it's a reminder of communist Soviet rule. Wow. When I sentenced for high treason, exactly in what Jewish agency is accused now. The only freedom which is still left is freedom of immigration. And who knows how long it will exist. That's why Jews who are concerned, they are finding themselves in fear society, in closed society, they're in a hurry to leave. Pincus Goldschmidt, who served as chief rabbi of Moscow, couldn't return from a trip because he didn't support the war in Ukraine. He's now in exile. These are complicated times and uh, the many dark clouds on the, on the horizon. 
also for the Jewish community. And this has been reflected in a great exodus of members of the Jewish community who have left Russia since the beginning of the war. Svetlana and her husband made Aliyah from Russia two months ago. We've hidden her identity to protect her family in Russia. We are very happy with that we made this decision. The political tension is rising and uh, the activity of Sakhnov is apparently being questioned at the moment by Russian authorities. Uh, not a lot of people can actually leave. Rabbi Goldschmidt says tens of thousands more Jews in Moscow with Israeli citizenship simply left. He expects the trend to continue. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. An important story to tell. Gordon, those numbers of immigrants from Ukraine and Russia are just astounding. And it's been astounding, the number of immigrants. But here's the great news, and it is great news. There's a place for them to go, and it's called Israel. You go back 130 years to the pogroms, the horrible persecution of the Jews in the Pale, uh, the, the massacres that happen. Uh, they had to petition the Ottoman Empire in order to go to Israel. And now there is a nation for them, a nation where they will be protected, where they will have freedom. Pope Francis wraps up his week-long visit to Canada today. And while he was there, the Pope apologized for the church's treatment of the native population over the past two centuries. More than 150,000 children were taken from their families. They were sent to church-run boarding schools where many suffered abuse. The same thing happened right here in the United States. And Mark Martin brings us the story from Montana. When he was a child, Blackfeet Nation member Wes Bremner attended the Cutbank Boarding School in northwestern Montana. As a second grader in the 60s, distance and harsh winters made it a necessity. The school environment proved harsh as well. Bremner says physical abuse started on day one when a staff member punched him. He thumped me right between the eyes and almost knocked me out. And I went against the wall, and it was kind of wobbly on my feet. And uh, he said, now you go to bed. And it was about this time of day. Bremner is just one of many students who say they endured harsh corporal punishment and demeaning verbal abuse at indigenous boarding schools. And some came forward years later with allegations of sexual abuse. We asked Bremner if that ever happened to him. If I was, I would take it to my grave. And why is that again? the past. It's not something you would, uh, it's nobody's business. The boarding school where Bremner attended is still operational today. He says it's better run and the abuse that took place when he was a student is unheard of. On the Flathead Reservation in Montana, indigenous boarding schools existed alongside St. Ignatius Mission. The Jesuit priest and pastor, Father Craig Hightower, says abuse happened at these schools as well. There was some sexual abuse, there's no question about it, um, and that's already been litigated in court. Uh, the majority of the abuses were uh, trying to take away their culture, uh, trying to assimilate them into the white world, uh, and the corporal punishment of the day. The, I mean, just the corporal punishment that was common at that time. All that is left of the original Ursuline Academy are the remains of this grotto that held a statue of Mary. Children ages preschool to high school gathered in a building that once stood on this property. Was it worse with the priests and the nuns? Maybe, maybe not. But that, those were the big controversies of, uh, of kids, you know, really being be beaten and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, that was part of the culture overall. According to the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, more than 350 U.S. government-funded and many times church-run boarding schools operated in the 19th and 20th centuries. The movement started under the Indian Civilization Act of 1819 with the goal of assimilating indigenous children. Bremner says his mother was one of thousands of kids taken from their communities. He says at her school, there was a sign that read, kill the culture, save the child. 
Montana State Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy says while Crow Tribe children weren't forcibly taken, the goal remained the same. Children weren't allowed to speak the language. Um, that was, and um, part of it was the hair was cut, especially with the boys uh, and the girls, their, their hair was cut, and then they were forced to move into the, the modern dress. The 2021 discovery of more than 200 unmarked graves at an Indian boarding school in Canada led Deb Holland, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, to launch a national investigation, the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Holland, the first Native American cabinet secretary, says her eight-year-old grandparents were taken from their families. She hopes the investigation will shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past. A lot of them died. Some of them probably died from broken hearts, and a lot of them just died from being in close contact with disease that they couldn't get rid of because everybody was crammed in together. And so what we want for our children is to help them to get to reconnect to who they are and to be strong and, and to have thriving nations. That's what we hope um, Deb Howland will be able to do, is to change the policy, educational policy, to provide empowerment. It's no strange thing for Native American communities not to trust the government, but um, to, to be able to create and to heal bonds within Native American communities and county governments, state governments, and the federal government, and um, to have that conversation so that we can move forward. Mark Martin, CBN News, Montana. There's a lot to learn about our history and a lot to apologize for. When you look at the preamble to that act, it, it spelled out for the extermination of tribal identity. That was the goal. Uh, you take children from their parents, you put them in a boarding school, and then you indoctrinate them. You run those camps much like a military camp. Uh, and uh, the first thing they do in the military is shave your head. The same thing is, is going on. It was all under this concept we had of manifest destiny. In the Catholic world, it was called the doctrine of discovery, uh, that if a Catholic nation discovered another nation, uh, that allowed them to colonize it and even allowed them to enslave it. Uh, for the U.S., it was manifest destiny. It's our destiny to take over the entire continent. Uh, and in that, there was obvious conflict with the Indian tribes, and this was a goal to, well, let's exterminate them by assimilation. Uh, again, a lot to apologize for. Liana had her life all planned out. After graduating from college, she was determined to become an elite equestrian. Then she had a series of disturbing dreams, and before long, Liana bought a one-way ticket to South Asia. For more than 25 years, Dr. Liana Cinquanta and her humanitarian organization, We Ignite Nations, has been reaching South Asia with the love of Christ, providing education, training leaders, and shedding light on one of society's most horrific crimes. Our biggest vision is to actually end child slavery and child trafficking throughout this region of South Asia. Liana credits much of their success to her studies at Regent University. The leadership skills she learned there helped her revive the one-time struggling ministry. It was a breath of fresh air and everything really took off uh, more after that as far as my ministry and, and the work there in the nations. Liana says the decision to attend Regent was easy. Going into worldwide missions, though, took a push from God, two actually. The first came in 1985. At 15 years old, Leanna had decided God didn't even exist. Said, I don't see God, I don't hear God, I can't feel God, so he must not be there. That same year, her mom started going to church and made Leanna go with her. I didn't want to go. I didn't want anything to do with it. Church wasn't anything like she expected. The people were kind, caring Christians who loved God. I said, Lord, uh, I don't believe in you, but if you're there, show yourself to me. That was just the little crack of openness that the Holy Spirit needed. 
Still, Leanna needed a little push to give her life to Christ. So one morning, a few months later, she was awakened by a voice telling her there was someone in the guest bed in her room. She looked. And the person sat up on the side of the bed. And it was Jesus. I saw him as he would have looked on the cross. But as I looked into his eyes, there was no anger, only forgiveness, only love and acceptance. And in that moment, I knew God is real. Jesus is real. The Bible is the word of God. And I need to repent. The second push came years later. It was 1993. Leanna was 23, a recent college graduate, and working towards her lifelong goal of becoming an elite equestrian. That same year, she heard a message about global missions. It was the first time I ever heard about places in the world that had never heard about Jesus. And I thought, okay, somebody else can go there. I already know what I'm doing. In the coming days, God would get her attention again, this time through recurring dreams. And I saw South Asia, and I saw this particular region that was being ruled by demonic principalities. So Leanna started digging for answers. What she found was disturbing. And then I came to know that just millions and millions of children there in this region are being trafficked, they're being enslaved, 40% of the population is in slavery of some kind. Tragic. I knew I had to go to that place and bring hope and healing and Christ to those people. In 1996, Leanna bought a one-way ticket to South Asia and moved in with a Christian family. Immersing herself in the culture and sharing the gospel, she soon founded Tell Asia, what today is known as We Ignite Nations, or WIN. And that's how the Lord led me to the next step of strategy, to raise up the Native people and to empower them to go to their own people instead of me being the one out there in the front lines. By 2008, Leanna admits that the ministry had grown larger than her ability to lead it. My work in India was about to collapse because I didn't know how to delegate. I was desperate to have an opportunity to study leadership. And I was, I was looking for the best. And so the Lord led me to Regent. Leanna went on to earn her Doctor of Ministry degree through Regent's online program. So I finally got to study leadership. I got to study things that were practical that I could take back and apply in the field. But then you have the Holy Spirit anointed professors there to guide you in that study. And from that point, things have just grown and exponentially expanded. Since then, the ministry has seen a steady rise in schools, education, leadership training, and small businesses in villages across South Asia. Meanwhile, the fight to end child slavery and trafficking goes on. We even have produced a movie and now we're working on producing a video that's gonna go into the theaters that will literally inoculate whoever watches that against ever letting their kids be trafficked. Now running the ministry from the US, Leanna is thankful for God's leading and pushing through the years and how he used Regent University to help her fulfill her calling. It's not like you're just trying to find your own way. They are there guiding you and helping you to discover even elements of your calling that you never even knew were there. Just really saw Christ and saw their faith uh, demonstrated in the classroom and was very, very um, thankful to have that opportunity. Regent University, it's all about Christian leadership to change the world where people go out throughout the whole world and say, how can we bring Christ? How can we bring the kingdom of God? In God's kingdom, there's no sex trafficking. That's not allowed. Uh, let's make sure that people understand the consequences, the impact. It's incredible what happens when you just get inspired and say, yes, I want to go out with zeal 
And then when you add to that zeal wisdom, wonderful things can happen and you can see exponential growth. If you want to know how to get that wisdom and get trained at Regent University, get trained in an environment that supports your faith, uh, that all you got to do is call us and, and say, uh, I want more information. Here's the number. It's 866-910-7615. You can also go to regent.edu and get information of how you can apply, how you can go to school online. Uh, you don't have to leave what you're doing. You can do it right where you are, and that's anywhere in the world. So if you want more information, number's on the screen, 866-910-7615, or you can go to the website, regent.edu. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Numerous crisis pregnancy centers have been attacked since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, but they aren't giving up. One example, a center in Buffalo planning to reopen Monday after it was firebombed. Compass Care shut down after it sustained heavy damage to its building in June. Jane's Revenge, which has been described as a pro-abortion terrorist group, took credit for the attack, spray painting their signature, Jane was here on the side of the structure. You can read the full story on CBNNews.com, including why Compass Care CEO Reverend Jim Harden believes this is a decisive moment on abortion. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping pregnant women around the world with delivering newborns. Naomi, a mother in Peru, suffered from complications during her first pregnancy and was scared for her second baby. The Operation Blessing staff held a workshop for pregnant moms. That's when a doctor realized Naomi had high blood pressure. She received an emergency ultrasound through the OB program and was advised to go to the hospital. Doctors there detected her problem and she got a C-section returning home a few days later with a beautiful baby girl. Naomi was grateful for the workshops and ultrasounds that helped doctors figure out exactly what she needed. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting OB.org. Patricia was down and out. This single mom had to work nights in the soup kitchen after COVID kept clients away from her hair salon. Soon she ran out of money, and that's when help arrived, just in the nick of time. In a small community in Mexico, many businesses have been affected by the pandemic. Some closed permanently. Others remain empty, waiting for clients to return. That was the case for Patricia. I am a hairstylist. I like to transform the way people look. Before the pandemic, I had enough work. But since COVID, there haven't been many clients. Patricia is also a single mom, so there has been no one else to help her provide for her daughter. I remember one time I was desperate because I had to pay rent, electricity, and gas. I looked for other ways to get that money. I looked for another job. I work nights, four times a week, in a soup kitchen. When CBN's Orphan's Promise met Patricia, she told us they were not only out of money, she said she's not been able to replace broken and worn out equipment. Thanks to the donors of CBN's Orphan's Promise, we first provided the family with emergency food. Then we delivered some new hair cutting equipment, including professional clippers and a hair washing sink. This is an amazing surprise. Next, we gave her a new professional hairstyling chair that rotates and salon lab coats. We also provided training on how to manage the business. I now have more clients and feel like we are moving forward. I am very excited and grateful for everything they gave me. Honestly, I thank you all very much. These things are so beautiful. You know, the people that receive help are such hard workers. I mean, they are trying to do their best in adverse circumstances, trying to support their families, wanting to work, and simply not capable of finding work. In this scenario, COVID, which has affected the whole world, really shut this woman's business down. And what was she to do? We want to thank you, CBN partners, because you allowed us to come right into the midst of her need and not just give her those things that you saw that will allow her to build her business again. You gave her dignity, and you can't put a price tag on that. You gave her hope that tomorrow things will be well again. 
You know, to join the 700 Club is $20 a month. You and I can afford to do that. And when we do, we have an opportunity and the blessing to change someone's life, to change thousands of lives really every day all around the world. You'll be joining an army of people if you decide to become a 700 Club member who are out to change the lives of people who are struggling and hurting. We want to encourage you to do that. We have lots of club levels that you can join at. Maybe you're saying, well, $20 a month isn't enough, or maybe you're already a 700 700 Club member. Would you go up to the 700 Club Gold level with a gift of $40 a month? Or you might consider the 1000 Club at $84 a month. Our 2500 Club members join us at $209 or more a month. And then we have a Founders level that's $417 or more a month. That works out to $5,000 a year. You really can touch and change lives. And when we do it together, we can do it in a really meaningful way. So will you call now? Our number's toll free. It's right there on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. When you do, we want to say thank you for caring about other people by sending you Pat's latest teaching. I love this, Putting on the Armor of God. It's a teaching from the book of Ephesians. And in the day and the hour that we live in, we need to know what the armor is and how we can put it on in each of our spiritual walks. We want you to have this. It's free. It's our gift to you when you join the 700 Club now. So 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. Gordon? John Arroyo served two tours in Afghanistan, one tour in Iraq. He was stationed at Fort Hood in Texas on April 2nd, 2014. That afternoon, John had just parked his car when a 45 caliber bullet ripped through his neck. My friend calls me and she said, did you know there's a shooting? And I was like, oh my gosh, don't tell me John was shot. 30 minutes later, his captain shows up at the door. I went numb, and he's on the other side knocking and knocking. I'm shaking my head no because I don't want to hear it. It is. Open the door. Open the door. He's alive. Angel's husband, platoon leader John Arroyo, was rushed to Darnall Army Medical Center, where two surgeons immediately began operating to save his life. They soon discovered that a 45 caliber bullet had severed John's jugular vein and lodged deep within the nerves of his right shoulder. One of the physicians was ENT Dr. Alex McKinley. Close proximity gunshot wound to the neck with an expanding hematoma is a grave prognosis. We knew that it was go time. We made an incision over the area to try to control the bleeding. Once we stopped that, we exhaled a bit, but there was still bright red bleeding and so there was additional injuries. We looked and we knew that the bullet had gone through his what's called voice box, the area where your Adam's apple essentially is in your vocal cords, shattered his thyroid cartilage. And we knew that there was probably some significant damage to that area of his neck. To help John breathe, doctors inserted a tracheostomy tube in his neck. Then, Angel was finally able to see him. They took me back there. It was not my husband. His head was bigger than a basketball. His tongue was sticking out. It wouldn't even go back in. I just kept praying that everything would be OK. The following day, John was placed in a medically induced coma and transferred to Scott and White Memorial Hospital for additional care. There, doctors told Angel their prognosis for John. At that time, we knew a, he had lost a lot of blood. B, that his voice was probably going to be different because of the amount of injury that was sustained in the voice box. And we didn't know if his voice would ever be normal again. And then C, his arm and the movement of his arm based on where that bullet went, we had no idea if that was going to come back either. And they said he won't be able to talk because he's in a medical coma. So he's got to stay asleep until Saturday. And so I went beside him and I grabbed his hand and I was telling him I love him. And he woke up. When I first see my wife, I tried to sit up and I tried to talk to her. I just wanted her to know that I was gonna be okay. 
I told her father before he passed that I would take care of her. And it means everything. I couldn't speak and I was writing on a whiteboard. He's on medicine. He wouldn't be spelling right. Like I love you would be I H A just crazy. I didn't know I could love him as much as I do. Two days after the operation, when I first saw him, he was doing his best to speak. He'd put his finger on his tracheostomy tube. He had an intelligible voice, which is very unusual in this kind of situation. We knew right away that he was a fighter, and we knew that faith was a big part of who he was and that he believed 100% uh, that God was behind him and that he was going to get through his injuries. As John slowly recovered his voice, he began sharing what happened that day. Senator all units, just advise, we have an active shooter currently on Fort Hood. Just be advised, they're saying that the uh, vehicle was a dark Toyota Camry. I've been in combat several times. Being a Green Beret, you just know, you just know what shots fired sound like. And as I was looking where the shots were fired, a vehicle pulls up. The next shot I heard, I was hit. John had just parked his car outside the 1st Medical Brigade when a 45 caliber slug ripped through his throat. I see someone walking towards me in the distance. The individual gets close to me within 10 feet, and I realize that it's the shooter. Jesus, help. That's the only thing I could try to muster was Jesus help. Probably the simplest prayer I've ever prayed, but it was the most profound because he stopped, looked around, and then walked into a building. I was just paralyzed. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that he didn't see me. It was God. God shielded me. Eight minutes after the first shot, three medics came running to the scene. Gripping his throat, John called out to warn them. I yelled back to them from across the parking lot, no, I've been shot, there's a shooter. Army Specialist Ivan Lopez opened fire, killing three people and wounding 16 others. Confronted by military police in a parking lot, he then turned the gun on himself. They believe Specialist Ivan Lopez had an argument with a fellow soldier before the shooting. The suspect had been evaluated for post-traumatic stress disorder and was receiving treatment for depression and anxiety. In just a few weeks, John fully regained his voice. He was awarded the Soldier's Medal for heroism above and beyond the call of duty, for warning others on the day of the shooting. When everything was said and done, and I look at the sequence of events between where John was shot, the timing of how quickly he was taken from the location to the hospital, and then being rushed right to the operating room with two surgeons who were ready to go, being able to stop that bleeding, all of that in such a short period of time, I think it's nothing short of a miracle. I don't believe in luck. It's Christ. It's God. And I can't explain it any better than that. At the end of the day, I should never even be here. They said I would have a trach in my neck for a minimum of six months. It was out in two months. They said, we don't know if you ever talk again. I'm talking to you right now. They said that we don't know what's going on with your arm. My arm moves today. There's no limits when it comes to God. Here, John, clearly, there are no limits when it comes to God. Angels say the same thing, for with God, nothing is impossible. When you get that, when you understand everything you see around you, go out at night and look at the cosmos, the universe spread above you, all of that was created by him. He spoke it into being. He can speak over you, speak words of life, of healing, deliverance. He wants to do it. That's incredible news, too. It's not something you have to bargain with him for. You don't have to plead for it. You have to believe it. You have to believe what he's already done. For John, it was a very simple prayer. Two words. 
Jesus, help. And Jesus became his very present help in his time of need. He can become your very present help in your time of need. Just look the same way. Do the same thing. Believe that God is with you 100%. That's what John doctor said. He said, I knew John was going to come through because he knew God was with him 100%. God's all in. He's 100% for you. When you get that, then all things become possible. We're going to pray for you. Before we pray, we've got some other miracles. Here's Ann from Big Spring, Texas. She always watches the 700 Club. And then on June 27th, Terry said, someone else, you have very serious vascular issues. Your legs from the knees down, your feet are affected almost to the point of not being able to walk. God is healing that for you. Blood flow freely. You've been healed today. Well, as Terry prayed, and started moving her leg. She got up and started walking pain free. God only not only healed her foot, but he saved her soul. Praise wow. God. That's wonderful. Well, 22 years ago, Penny took a nasty fall. She seriously injured her coccyx bone. Her doctors informed her that there was nothing they could do. She was miserable from all of the pain and lack of sleep. She was watching this program one day and heard you, Gordon, say, someone with a broken coccyx bone, doctors have said they cannot do anything to heal you. Place your hand on the area. God is healing you right now. By faith, Penny placed her hand on her tailbone and she was healed. The inflammation in her left hip went away. Her back felt completely adjusted. Penny gives all the glory to God for her healing. Hallelujah. Give glory to God. Thank him for what he's about to do for you. Thank him for the cross, what he's already paid for you to walk free of the law of sin and death, for his forgiveness for all your iniquity and the provision healing of all your diseases. Let's walk into that all. Let's walk into that great possibility that we all have as children of God. We all get the same privilege to go boldly to him and get the answer to our need. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come to you believing. We come to you giving you thanks for who you are. When we're faithless, you remain faithful. You cannot deny yourself. If we confess our sins to you, you are faithful to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we turn to you, you always shine upon us. So Lord God, we come to you. We draw near to you. And we ask that you would draw near to us that the kingdom of heaven would invade our souls, our innermost being. Heal us of all our emotional wounds. Forgive us of all our sin and heal our bodies now. Speak words of deliverance. Sing songs of deliverance all around us. Speak words of healing and restoration over us now. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Terry, God's given you. Yeah, someone you have a, I, I don't think it's you. I think it's someone that you know, love, maybe a family member has a, a, an issue with the recurring collapse of a lung. And it happens unexpectedly just when everyone thinks success has been made. God's healing that condition right now, strengthening the walls of the lung, removing whatever it is that's hindering it, staying inflated and restoring breathing, natural breathing to the person that's struggling in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all you're doing. There's someone you've, um, you've had open heart surgery and, and your sternum hasn't healed properly. Um, God is restoring that bone. He's restoring everything. That No more pain. Um, no more. It's, it's almost like it's turning in. God's healed you of that. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Take that deep breath and realize there's no pain anymore. It's all gone from you now, in Jesus' name. Yes, someone else, you've broken your wrist uh, in a fall, and a, a quirky fall. God is healing that condition for you right now. It's, you've, you've had some um, therapy on it, but it's not 
it's not responded well. God's healing that, and the mobility that you want is coming back as well. Mm -hmm. Someone else with problems with your left hip, um, and there's like radiating pain down the back of your leg, leg to the back of your knee. Uh, I don't know if that's a hamstring injury or something related to the hip. I don't know, but you know. And you're touching it right now, and it's being healed. You're feeling uh, like a tingling, uh, almost a massage going into that uh, uh, thigh in Jesus' name. Be healed. Be set free from all of that pain now in the name of Jesus. And someone else, you have a, an eye that's swelling. I mean, it's, it's swelling considerably. I don't know what the condition is, but God's healing that for you right now. It's just going to go back to its normal size, and you'll not have a problem again. Um, this is, goes back to the first word that Terry had about lungs that the, wouldn't properly inflate. I don't know if this is a word that relates to lungs or not, but God gave it to me, so I'll just repeat it. Aeoli, uh, and may they be filled and may they the, be filled with air and may the structure of them be completely restored now. You're, you were waiting for something specific on that. In Jesus' name, be healed. Thank you, Lord and be made whole. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for what you have done and who you are. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. We always rejoice in what God is doing in the world today. He wants to heal his children. He wants to provide, and, and he wants us to be his witnesses, to show forth what he has doing, what he is doing in the world today. If you need prayer, we're here for you, and we believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that doesn't stop, keeps on asking, keeps on knocking until you get the answer. Same number, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Psalm 91. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. For Terry, for me, for all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again next week.